My name is uh, Dr Richard Taylor, a retired physician, independent Member of Parliament for Wire Forest, which of course includes Kidderminster, Stourport and Bewdley. I'm very privileged to follow a line of eminent MPs, Stanley Baldwin, Gerald Nabarro, members of the Brinton family and other people over the years. It really is a privilege to represent this part of Worcestershire where we have lovely country as well as busy towns and Stourport itself is a town that people can drive through really almost without noticing it because parts of it are hidden away. It came to prominence in towards the end of the 18th century when the industrialists of the Midlands realised that they needed a canal to join the River Severn to the industrial Midlands heartland. And that's when the canal was dug and entered the River Severn at Stourport. And we still have <clears throat> the most magnificent docks hidden away behind the main street of the town. There are plans afoot to regenerate these docks and we have every hope that they will be opened up to the centre of the town and they are really worth a visit. I've worked in this area for <clears throat> about 30 years and I've come to know the people of Wire Forest, including Starport, really very well. And as a doctor, I've found them some of the nicest people that you can have uh, to work with. We certainly welcome visitors. There are a lot of caravan parks. I really hope you enjoy this video and get an insight of the town of Starport and realise that as a Georgian Dockland town, it is well worth a visit. Yes, Stourport is an interesting town and it has a, we hope it has a, f a good future, but it certainly has an interesting past. It's a unique town as it's the only town in the kingdom to come into being as a result of a canal being built. Before we uh, go around the town to look at some of the interesting buildings and features, I must tell you something of the history of the town. When James Brindley arrived in the area, he first of all surveyed the country and realised that there was a landfall. To bring his canal through, he would have to build locks, many locks. So he decided in his wisdom to follow the line of the River Stour. This is the reason then you find that the uh, entrance to the Staffs and Worcester Canal in Stairport within a hundred yards or so of the confluence of the two rivers, the Stour and the Severn. Interestingly, in olden times we, we now learn that there was a hamlet near the mouth of the river Stour and the area was known as Stour Mouth. So this is the site that Brindley chose to bring his canal into the river Severn. In Br Brindley's early surveyings, he decided to take over an area on the uh, left-hand side of the river, looking down from the present bridge, where he would build a port. On little scraps of paper, where he made most of his plans, he used the word Newport, the Newport on the Severn. When it was pointed out to him that there were already several Newports in the kingdom, he changed the name to Stairport, two words. With the completion of the canal in May 1772, Brindley now set about building a town around the port, the port area. Businessmen, entrepreneurs were soon aware that here was a means 
of being able to transport their goods very quickly. So with the building of some houses around this area, Brindley envisaged a town and businessmen came flooding into the town and in really in a matter of 30 years there were carpet mills, spinning mills, a brass and iron foundry, a vinegar brewery, wharves, dockyards and all the other paraphernalia that went to make up a port. The original houses that were built at that time in Stairport, most of them were still with us in places like Mart Lane, Litchfield Street, what we call Lower Mitten, that is Mitten Street, Severn Road, which used to be called Severn Lane, and also Gilgal. In my boyhood, these buildings in New Street were occupied by a family named Smallwood. In the 1930s, this building was purchased by the Stairport Council. Part of it was used as offices, part the council chamber, and the ground floor was used as the town library. As we move down New Street, we see some of the fine 18th century uh, buildings of the town and would have been occupied by the wealthy merchants and businessmen, particularly associated with the canal and river trade. This then was James Brinley's original crossroads, comprising New Street, York Street, High Street and Bridge Street. Many shop owners worked very hard and most families lived above the business premises. Shops always sold exactly what they advertised. Let's see what the town centre used to look like.
I just love to see this, the people coming to Starport. In fact, one bank holiday, I walked across the bridge and I did a kaleidoscope for pictures of all the people having a happy time. And there's nothing gives me more pleasure. I was born in Cyan Gardens in the High Street. And I, I've now got eight generations here with the new baby. There's a picture of my own mother, seven or eight years old, at the top of the high street. Uh, a celebration, I believe, of George V, who reigned from 1910 to 1935. I cleaned the Midland Bank in the high street for 30 years, and my aunt before me, she did it for 25 years. Lovely post office we had, which is now Woolworths. It was a beautiful building with a lovely clock that we all enjoyed. And then there was um, bottom of Cyan Gardens, there was uh, Mr. Jack Vickers and his, his shop was called Paris House. I absolutely love Starport. Born and bred here and I don't want to go anywhere else. Uh, the shops in Stairport used to uh, specialise in different things and there was one particular one was a Mr Lewis used to go around the district with a motorised van and he used to deliver paraffin vinegar and household goods. In I think it was 1936 I went to the new school, I was just 11 years old and it was a newly opened, the county senior school. Uh, as a lad, I used to help my father in his, in his uh, barber shop at 24 Lombard Street, where he'd been in business for 40 years. And I used to lather for him and also keep the shop tidy, but I never intended to be a hairdresser because I never liked that sort of business. Early in his life, he left school at the age of 13. On the 30th of September, he was 13, and on the 1st of October he started work as an apprentice with Thomas Biggerton in the High Street and there he worked for, had to work for the first two years for nothing. Mr Biggerton having to find him three meals a day. On the third year he had to work, his wages was two shillings which is 10p in today's money and for the fourth year three shillings which was 15p, and for the fifth year, four shillings, which is 20p in today's money. In the town area alone, there were about 10 pubs. Today, we find there are only about five. They have a significant place in Stairport's history. For example, the Bridge Inn and the Crown were frequented mostly by holiday makers. The rising sun always had strong connections with the iron foundry. The Swan was the town's coaching house. The bird in hand was used mostly by watermen, as was the Black Star. But the Black Star also had its own chapel for watermen. It was also the home of the Victoria Brass Band formed in 1875. Today's leisurely pace is much different from the past. The staffs of Worcester Canal would have been seething with narrowboats carrying their wares in and out of the port. These buildings were once the workshops where all the maintenance would be carried out on the length of the canal. The Warfield Blocks and the toll house look a lot smarter now that they have been restored. The delightful lock shop tea rooms used to be the toll house for bridge traffic. 
So let's go in and have a cup of tea. John Wesley, the famous Christian evangelist, visited the town in these early days on three separate occasions. This was due to the fact that he was a personal friend of Aaron York, who was the first harbour master in Stairport. The plainness of the outer buildings of the Methodist Church do not do justice to the wonderful ornate alabaster work inside. Oakley is one of the oldest buildings in Stourport. It dates back to 1751. The interior walls are timber framed with wattle and daub. This was the home and practice of Dr. James Brockett from 1922 until the 1940s. York House. This was the home of Aaron York. He was the first harbour master a coal and wood merchant, but he dealt with many of the commodities that came into Stairport. From this lofty position he could see all the goings on in the port. Litchfield Street is one of the oldest streets in the town still with its fine Georgian houses. Mart Lane, this was where the first open markets were held. The remaining dwellings are all listed properties. past, various haulage companies used these buildings to store their bog trade goods, items like vinegar, carpets, brass and iron items and many more. These goods would have been stored in places like the wharf and the clock warehouse. The clock has been a landmark since the early 19th century. All the basins would have been a hive of activity put in Stairport next to Birmingham as the busiest inland port in the whole of the Midlands. We all welcome the new type of trade in the town. Tourists, holiday makers and boat people. People from all over the world pass through hopefully enjoying this unique town.
The Tom Torin is undoubtedly the most prestigious Georgian building in the town. Originally it was built by the canal company as the headquarters and hotel of the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal Company. It was here that all the great meetings took place, all the great decisions were taken, and when these meetings were finished, it became a place of great revelry, with huge banquets taking place, and a good deal of wines and spirits being consumed. These dwellings are close to the river and the canal and were used by the boat people. They have been well looked after. The gardens are a great credit to the present occupants. The Angel Pub has been here since the beginning of the 18th century and is very popular with visitors all the year round. So let's go in and have a drink. The main industry of Starport was the manufacture of carpets. The majority of the people in the town worked in this trade. In some cases, every member of a family did so. At its height, over 2,000 people worked at the Starport factory of Bondworth. Cheap imports slowly eroded the trade and production ceased in the late 90s. Most of the remaining workforce moved to this main factory at Kidderminster, now called Carpets of Worth. The machines and methods have not changed much over the years. A lot of these carpets are still exported all over the world. And when I left the senior school, I left in Easter, at Easter time in 1943, and my first job was on the Severn and Canal Canning Company. Yes, left school at 14. I went to, I was, um, I worked in a cafe for eight weeks, half a crown a week, and then I went to Worth's and earned eight and six. I worked there several times. I was a thread on a threading machine. I started on a wage of 15 shillings a week and I took home net 12 and six. 10 shillings I gave to my parents for my keep and I had half a crown for pocket money. Well, I left school when I was 14 years of age and uh, work was difficult to get and the starting wage for lads leaving school at 14 was 10 shilling a week, 50p in the, in the metric money. But uh, there was not, not much choice because there was uh, carpet works to work in or the uh, foundry and there was uh, vinegar works and the, uh, the power station. So I chose, I'd already chosen before I left school, I wished to be an electrician. So I went to work at the power station. From there, I had a short period of time at IMI at Summerfield before I joined the Navy at 18. And I well remember the Squirrel Pub at Arley Kings, where the licensee was a Mrs. Sutton, a very nice lady. And during the war, from time to time, we used to have postal orders sent to us uh, from Mrs. Sutton, from the, the people from the pub who used to contribute for the serving sons of Arley Kings, and daughters, of course, of Arley Kings. And at the end of the war, she sent us all a letter with all the names of the lads that had served in the war and a final payment. And I've never, ever forgotten that lady for that.
The Starport Meadows are used for all kinds of activities, apart from the regular family picnics and the fabulous carnival held in September. It's also the venue for the annual Royal International Dog Show. Thank you very much indeed. I would just like to welcome you all to Starport on Severn once again. Uh, you're very welcome here and we're very pleased to see you at the uh, Royal International Ex Exemption Dog Show. The late Queen Mother had donated a prize each year since it started in 1993. The prize in March 2002 was one of her last acts before her death. The show also had links with the late King Hussein of Jordan. He sent £4,000 the first year it started and was coming to visit in 2000, but that was the year he died. There's been a King Hussein trophy awarded ever since it started. The event is open to everyone, even first timers. So come and have some fun. I've been coming here now for uh, oh, I'm 81 now. I've been coming here now since I was a boy of 8 or 10. My uncle used to bring me and we used to fish in the river. But when I first came we used to come on the train to Kidderminster and it was 11 old pence. For a good many years, ever since my own grown up children, when they were babies, ever since they were babies, we used to push them along here. Uh, with a push chair and we'd walk for miles and uh, we used to spend many a nice evening just walking along as well and uh, we still continue to come with the grandchildren now Oh many years since uh, we've, we've got the grandchildren with us today but we've been coming all oh, up to 20 years or since uh, Yeah since ours were little and, our, and the youngest is 36 so we've been coming here quite a, quite a few years we like coming to Starport because it's very good entertainment for the children. Uh, there's every amenity for them, there's plenty of nice grass for them to play on, plenty of amusements, swimming if they wanted, a uh, nice little trip up the river on a boat if they wanted. Well, it's, it actually serves a multitude of purposes for us. We live about uh, 20 minutes away and uh, we can achieve a lot of things here. Uh, even though it's quite a small place so we can food shop, my husband can uh, frequent the betting shop and uh, Katie and I can come down here and um, we can kick a ball about and, and we have a bit of fun. It, it's good clean fun as far as we're concerned. She also likes the, uh, the play area that's over there uh, and we, it, it's, it just serves a multitude of purposes for us really. What I like about Starport is the friendliness of the people and it's just a small place you get to know people very well, very quickly and uh, there's so much to, things to see and do and the scenery is wonderful. You can look out upon the, 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 the well the hills. But it doesn't matter where you look does it? It doesn't matter where you look. Yeah. All the, and, and on, a sunny, on, a, on a sunny day it's absolute magic.
we consider that tourism in Stanport is extremely important and has been important ever since, ever since the war basically. In the early 50s uh, this was basically just a field, a farmer's field, and the farmers allowed people to bring their tents and uh, camp here for weekends in Stourport to enjoy the riverside meadows uh, and, and slowly tourism built over the years uh, for people to come every weekend. As time went on, people wanted better accommodation. As their livings got better, uh, uh, they progressed onto caravans, uh, uh, which was uh, much better accommodation for them to use. Spending more time in Stourport, they were getting a little bit more leisure time uh, and being able to enjoy the surroundings in the area. Uh, and those have progressed from being basic, very basic, uh, to what you see today, which is high technology. In most cases, better than your own homes people have been coming week in week in there for 30 40 years uh, they've been coming themselves and their children and now sometimes their children's children back to Stairport time and time again with more and more people coming to Stairport caravan parks have moved on a long way from the days of fetching your water from a standpipe in the middle of a field now to fully serviced units with microwave ovens baths showers there's nearly a thousand privately owned caravans in Stairport uh, and these uh, families spend uh, approximately three to five thousand pounds of their expendable income each year uh, in the local economy. Uh, this has been uh, proved by the survey back in 1995 in conjunction with the Tourist Board. That equates to some, somewhere in the region of three to five million pounds uh, of uh, the Midlanders' money coming into the local economy of Stourport. The population of Stourport is probably about 20,000 people and that number is probably doubled at high season with tourism alone and people coming to their caravans for weekends. I've been coming down to Stourport I would say roughly about close on 40 years but caravanning I've been about 34 years. Since about 1947 when I was in the Sea Cadets. Moving down the River Severn from Stairport Bridge, we pass on the left hand side the Vinegar Works and immediately by the Vinegar Works is the River Stair. So you're, now you're looking at the confluence of the two rivers. Moving farther down the river, about 1,200 yards from Stairport Bridge, is a huge sandstone cliff under which are redstone caves. Redstone caves are the only ancient natural feature in the whole of the town of Stairport. They are many hundreds of years old, how old nobody seems to know. But a very long time ago, these caves were there. No doubt in ancient times they were used as shelters for vagrants, outlaws and river pirates who would prey on boats passing up and down the Severn carrying merchandise, something that has gone on since Roman times. By the 11th century, the caves had become the shelter for hermits, and in 1160, the Bishop of Worcester gave them uh, some standing as a hermitage and appointed a hermit master, Richard Spetchley. During this period, we also know that uh, a man named Lyman, who was a monk, lived in, uh, as a hermit in one of the caves, as he was the priest in charge at Arley King's Church. Following the dissolution of the monasteries and religious houses in the reign of Henry VIII, large numbers of monks were to be found wandering around the countryside with nowhere to live and no particular place to go. Redstone Caves became a place where they could find shelter and we believe that many hundreds of them lived in and around the caves. It was during this period that a great deal of excavation work took on and uh, the, ca the caves were enlarged to something like the size uh, that they are and what we see today. 
Dr. Nash, the Worcester historian in the 18th century, reported that the, the cows were being used as a school and a cider house. And also a family named Glover lived in the caves. The layout of the caves inside, there is a large chamber which was once used as a chapel and uh, along the uh, front of the caves is a long passage. Into this passage are cut caves and looking inside the caves you can see niches which have been dug out of the walls where no doubt cupboards were uh, placed to hold the monks' belongings and also fireplaces with chi two chimneys which were bored out to the heights above. When I was a boy, it was a regular thing in summer for some 11 year old boy to be trapped down these chimneys. They were either trying to climb up them or down them and they'd be trapped and the local fire brigade would be called out to rescue them. And these boys uh, uh, had a particular uh, sort of fame in the playground at school afterwards. They'd also have bare knees and uh, scabs on their elbows. Authorities eventually filled these uh, chimneys in shortly after the Second World War. Tom Time Buildings goes back, way back, 1818, and, and uh, my grand's father was born there, and they were all boat builders. Uh, Emily Baldwin, she married my granddad, Henry Buckley, he was soon a boat builder and he ended up by building the first icebreaker on the canal when he was 60 years old in 1930 and it's still on the water. Uh, James Baldwin, he sold a boat raft on the river for £500 and he bought eight cottages up Sion Gardens and he gave his four daughters two cottages each one to live in and one to let. And later on, Albert and I lived in one and I paid six and sixpence a week rent. And then uh, later on, when I was a post lady, also cleaned the bank, but post lady as well, I saw that they were pulling the cottages down and that was sad, that was the 1980s. I was proud to stand on the on the bridge and see the pictures of Grandad's boat raft, Grandad and his son. Grandad was Henry Buckley and his son Harry Buckley. And then beyond that was the old swimming baths that I went in once and then it floated away one flood time one storm. It, it was just just river water, but it was a wooden swimming baths. The uh, Stourport Civic Society, which is a collection of people from all walks of life who are interested in not only the past and the history of the town, but very much in the future of the town. And it's the future of the town that we're all uh, looking at at the moment and there are working parties and meetings going on uh, <coughs> at this very time to think how to rejuvenate the town centre, how to connect it into the docks and how to make this uh, town really, which is so proud of its heritage, how to make it able to show off its heritage because we do have large numbers of tourists coming through the town, caravanners, boating people and we believe we could make it even more attractive so it's a very exciting time to be making this uh, film this sort of viewpoint of Starport because there is so much going on so much needs to be done and I'm delighted that so many people are really beginning to think about the future These Starport children represent the future.
They will have the experience of living in an historical Georgian town amongst pleasant scenery. The next generations will be responsible for passing on their knowledge of local history. Let's see if it's in good hands. We at Stourport High School are really proud of the fact that it's a town school and we're really keen for our students to get the very best examination results they can. In fact, in recent years the school has gone from strength to strength. It's now oversubscribed with a waiting list. We have better examination results than we've ever had before and we've just had an excellent Ofsted report. We at Stourport High School are really proud to be part of the local community and take history and local heritage very seriously. We're lucky to have uh, staff here who have not only lived in Stourport but have also been members of the high school and they're now teaching here or working as teaching assistants. We're also really keen to make sure that our students get the very best education that they can one of the ways we do this is by students studying local history. In Year 9 at the moment, students are studying lots of different aspects of local history and are involved in the local community. Our sixth form students are at present studying for their A-levels. But today, they're talking to Jeff Neal, a local historian, and they're talking to him about Stourport and its local heritage. Do you know how Stourport came about? We've done some research and in 1771 there was nothing here apart from six houses and a public house until they started to be, build the canal which brought most of the population of Stafford. When the canal was built, industries came to the area, the families followed and the population exploded from a couple of dozen up to 4,000 in a very short time. Are your parents originally from Stafford? Well, my nan moved over to England from Ireland when she was a little girl with her mum and dad. And my, grand my granddad moved over and started working the sugar beet. And my mum was born in Starport. Well, Jeff, um, my mum's family, they were all brought up around the area, mainly in Starport. But my dad's family came from like Birmingham yeah. and he moved down into Droitwich and then met with my mum. Well, I've been living over here for um, 12 years. When I was brought over here when I was five with my parents when we moved to Starport. My granddad origi originated from um, Ireland and he came over to Starport on just like a day, on a day trip. And then he met my nan, which she, I think she was born down here. But her parents, my nan's parents was from Wales. And then my, my mum and my dad met down in Starport as well. My dad was born in Starport, but my mum was born in Budley. Yeah, well, these people came from all over, from South Wales, from uh, Staffordshire, London, Ireland, Scotland, all over, all flooded in to the town and made it the place that it is. There are um, a few large houses in Starport which have now been turned into old people's homes. Is there any well-known people who used to live there? Ravenhurst, which is uh, near the traffic lodge at the top of Lickhill Road and Bewley Road, was principally the home of Thomas Vale, the builder, who built the present bridge in Stairport in 1870. And uh, afterwards, it became a private school for a number of years after the war, and then was converted into a retirement home for elderly people. Lickhill Manor was the home of Thomas Bondworth, the carpet manufacturer, up until the Second World War. During the Second World War, it was used as a maternity hospital. And after the war, it became a hotel, and then it was eventually converted into an old people's home. The third house, of course, is Arley House, which is just over the bridge. And that was originally part of the uh, Arley Estate, which was owned by the Lloyds. The house was built around about 1870, and at one time it was occupied by John Rogers, who was the man that brought the tannery to Stourport. 
After the Second World War, it was first of all used as a hotel, and then a sort of a restaurant, and then the county council took it over and turned it into a nursing home for elderly people. Well, we just finished talking to the uh, girls and boy in the upper sixth form, and I think you might agree with me that the future of the school and the town is in good hands.